can't see me, but you can see my tie. Am I right? I'm trying to send a message. <laughs> okay. That's right. Forget about it. All right, so. We're going to get started. We have a lot to get through today, a lot of fun stuff, uh, some, um, some great sessions to conclude our conference. But before we get started, we got to do a raffle or two, right? And um, before I forget, the announcement um, after Dr. Nina Cross's uh, presentation, we're going to have a short break. And if you could bring your stuff with you, because we're going to transition a couple of the, the tables here for the group activity. Okay? So, would you like to select the raffle? Sure. All right. We'll see if we can find a winner in less than 20 minutes <laughs> this time. 8626. 8626. A lot of people. Got to be here to win. 8579. 8579. Okay, on our way to 20 minutes. 8601. All right, there we go. Great. <laughs> that one's spent? Yeah, we'll do uh, two more. 8572. 8572. All right, keep pulling, Bill. 8624. All right, got it. Fantastic. So we got the awards at the uh, the back of the room. So the gifts. So take advantage. Yep. Thank you. Whoops. No problem. Perfect. So that one is spent. Eight six one five. Eight six one five. Eight five nine five. All right, we got it. Good job. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> All right, thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Those are spent. We'll give those people another chance. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Martha Burns. She's going to introduce Dr. Nina Kraus. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Nina Krauss to you. As you probably all are very aware at this point in time, I've always been intrigued with scientists who are interested in where science is going, not where science is right now. And when I first started teaching at Northwestern, I was running a department at Evanston Hospital, um, and I started adjunct teaching at Northwestern. And there was this rising star who had just gotten her dissertation done. This is 1981 when I started teaching. And everyone was talking about this new doctoral student um, and her dissertation. It was Nina Krauss. And her area of investigation was very intriguing to me at that time because she was looking at neuroplasticity of auditory neurons. And this is the early 80s, and not very many people were talking about plasticity. There was a lot of research into the auditory system, and there was a lot of research with animals trying to figure out how the auditory cortex is organized. But this was the first time I'd ever heard of someone actually researching the plasticity of auditory neurons. So I was fascinated with that and started learning a little bit about her. And then a colleague of hers told me a story about her that I have to share with you. I hope I get this right. She'll correct me if I get it wrong, because this is hearsay. But she said, you know what's really cool about Dr. Krauss is, yeah, she is this neurobiologist, and she's studying, you know, the, the biology of the, of the brain very rigorously, but she really cares about application, and she really cares about kids. And the story goes that what got her started in this area, and I hope I'm saying this correct, this is a, you know, a guy from a colleague, but 
that um, she had a little boy she was working with in the 70s who had normal auditory um, tests on standard pure tone threshold testing, but had no brain stem responses. On an ABR, she wasn't getting responses. And this little boy was having a lot of problems with learning, a lot of struggles in school. And she became very interested in this area, which eventually became a lot of people like Chuck Berlin, which many of you know, whom who many of you know, the area of auditory neuropathy. Now, I was a clinician. I still am a clinician. I was running a department at Evanston Hospital. I've always been interested in neuropathology, and I was intrigued with this brilliant scientist who really cared about kids and really cared about learning. So I just kept listening to what she was doing and reading some of her area, some of it's way over my head. Um, uh, but because I'm interested in neuropathology, she then started working with auditory processing disorders um, and learning, and the relationship between auditory processing and language. Now, this was a taboo topic, in a way, in a lot of areas when she was doing this, as Paula talked about yesterday. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think if I recall, it took you years to get the paper on the little boy published, even. Yeah. So this was just not an area people were comfortable with. Because, as I said yesterday, Noam Chomsky was kind of dominating the world of language, and he believed everything could be understood through grammar and syntax. And so I've been following her a long time. We, I worked with her colleague, with her um, doctoral student, Nicole Russo, and did some of the fast-forward implementations for Nicole when she was looking at auditory processing disorders in autism spectrum. Um, and then Nina and I met a couple years ago, I think, or a year or so ago, and she was telling me about her new research at the Brain Volts um, Lab and as the auditory lab at Northwestern on identifying young preschool children before they present with language and reading problems and perhaps being able to prevent dyslexia in many cases. Um, and that this was something that she was interested in. At, but just to give you a feeling of how broad-based she is, and I don't want to take her time, uh, so I don't want to make this too long, but I, she also, I don't know if you know this, is a very accomplished musician. She's a classical pianist, I think. I think I'm correct about this. She plays the electric guitar, which fascinates me, um, and other electronic instruments, and has also studied and had a lot of papers published in The Power of Music, um, how music is processed in the brain, but also, and Donna Geffner talked about this yesterday, how musical training actually improves auditory processing, but also improves learning. So she's kind of straddled all these worlds. And then, and I was telling her this story, Jim and I are getting ready at Christmas for the family to come down um, for, and he's trimming the tree, and he takes a little break to go out and get coffee, and so I go on the internet quickly and try to figure out what's going on in, in the world of, of science, and there's this nature article. <laughs> I try to hide it from him. He thinks I'm a bit of a workaholic. So he's a star. So there's this article, this headline in the nature email that I got, their news article, on this new rapid way to identify um, their simple way, fairly, scalable way to identify concussions in children and athletes um, that is 90% reliable. Now, I, this is my other world, is teaching about adult neuropathology um, and lecturing on it. And so you may not know, but concussions are very hard to reliably diagnose. And they're done often with what's called a side, for an athlete, what's called a sideline test where the athlete gets knocked over, he's acting a little funny, the coach decides to ask him to do a few cognitive tasks, maybe walk in straight line, and then maybe sends him back out on the field again, or her. And to be able to diagnose concussion reliably 
and simply would be remarkable. Well, I'm, and this is out of Northwestern, and I'm saying, oh, my gosh, who's doing this research? And it's Dr. Nita Kraus. So Jim comes back from Starbucks, and I said, would you mind finishing the tree? There's this fascinating article I've got to read before all the family descends on us. But anyway, that's my introduction to Nina Kraus. <laughs> We are very lucky to have her. She is a widely regarded uh, speaker, and I'm pleased as punch that she's here today. <laughs> Marty, thank you so much. That was that was great. I, I, uh, usually, people just uh, you know can't be bothered to think about the speaker that much, and they just read something from the internet, and uh, so I, I, I really appreciate <laughs> um, But I get to talk to you about listening uh, to the learning brain on the, and the neurobiology of listening and uh, of literacy. I have my financial disclosure statement, as I've been told to do, um, and what's important here is this idea of auditory processing. I'm going to try to talk quickly, because I want Marty to hear as much of my talk as, as, <laughs> as, as she can before she hops on a plane. Um, but auditory processing, of course, is important for language development, for reading, and for understanding speech and noise, so understanding in complex environments. So auditory processing is really at the center of, you know, disciplines, learning, language, and uh, audiology. Um, and I have to tell you about sound. So sound is this incredibly powerful force that is central to communication. It's invisible. And a lot of the world's most powerful forces, like gravity and magnetism, are invisible. So we don't sometimes realize how incredibly important sound is. And um, you know, if you contrast it to a visual object, uh, you know, you could, you, the visual system is, is I, I like to say, materialistic. Because, you know, you can see a thing and you can feel it. Uh, it has a color, a shape, texture, and it's, it's very easy to understand, uh, which is, you know, why there has been a National Institute for Vision way before there was one for hearing. Um, so, you know, people just don't realize the importance of, 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 of hearing because with hearing, um, you know, the attributes are, are much more abstract. And they're fleeting because, by definition, sound sound moves. Sound is never in, in one, you can't hold it. And so, um, and did I say it was invisible? So, um, you know, we, we have a tremendous amount of information, just as much information in sound as there is in visual objects. But um, we sometimes are not as aware of it, but as neuroscientists and somebody who loves signals, uh, we look at this very carefully. So again, I want to just contrast, so speed, and I want to say, you know, processing sound is one of the hardest things, the most difficult jobs that we ask our brain to do, and especially because of the timing aspect, which is why getting hit in the head is something that is very delicate machinery. Um, but so, you know, you, you, can, you can see sound is happening and uh, neurons are firing and, you know, you can see an action potential or neurons firing about every millisecond or so. With the visual system, it takes longer. So, you know, it took a while for the neuron to fire and, you know, you're looking at about 40 milliseconds or more for neurons to fire in response to some visual object. And, you know, I like to look, you know, compare these. Let's let this go for a little bit. You know, see how fast this is happening and see how slow, by, def by, by contrast, the visual processing is. So um, you really, the, the auditory system is the, uh, is, is the temporal expert of the brain, the timing expert of the brain. And also, there's processing that happens even less than a millisecond. So to be able to, when, when, when sound hits 
our two ears, which is something that's very important for us to identify objects. You know, well, that's the tuba over there. Um, it's because of the relative difference of, of, of timing that happens. Um, so sound goes into one ear, then hits the other ear, and then there are these coincidence detectors in the brain that are happening. They, they are, yeah, in the MSO that uh, are, are, are firing with microsecond precision. And um, so, so, you know, so, so again, sound is coming into the brain and the system is, you know, do some math and figure out what the sound is that, 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 that has now hit your ears. Um, making sense of sound um, involves pathways, of course, that connect the ear uh, to the brain, but m importantly, there are even more pathways that come from various parts of the brain that inform auditory processing uh, based on how we think and we hear uh, and we feel about sound. Um, so uh, I, I, I um, uh, would like to tell you about that there's a, a paper we finally you know, I've been talking about this in just about every discussion section for you know the last years in our papers and I finally put this concept all in one place in this ticks paper um, of the fact that hearing really involves our sensory cognitive motor and reward networks inherently um, and and so you know I want you to listen to this and tell me if you hear <laughs> Can you hear anything? Listen to this. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Now listen to this. See? So 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 now you're you know, I wasn't kidding. Your knowledge about sound impacts how you hear it. Yes or no? Yes. Right? Um, so, you know, what about our reward system? Um, we got these little guys. reward system is, and that's so important for learning. We know from animal models, controlled experiments, that animals learn faster, they remember longer, if you stimulate the reward system in the brain. Um, these, are, these are my three boys, my three babies. And uh, you, you know what it's like when, when people say, it's so good to hear the sound of your voice. And, you know, when, when I hear them on the phone, I mean, even before I'm listening to what they're saying, it's just... Oh, it's just so good to hear the sound of your voice, and that's because my, my limbic system is, is, is engaged. Uh, so, you know, how you feel about sound impacts how you hear it, yes or no? Yeah. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about me. Uh, you've probably heard too much already. Um, but, but my mommy um, was someone who, she, she's a, an immigrant, um, and, and she, so I lived in a household where more than one language was spoken. So sound was, you know, I realized, carried something that I needed to pay attention to. And also she was a pianist. And I, one of my favorite places to hang out was underneath the piano. I would, I would take all my stuff and just kind of, you know, play underneath there. Um, and then as a biologist, I, I really... I've been working on trying to harness biology to understand sound processing and learning in a way that actually informs human health. Because, um, you know, I, I started out uh, counting hair cells and recording from uh, the eighth nerve of the chinchilla. I was measuring something like two-tone suppression in the auditory nerve. And here's where my mommy comes in again. And she says, Nina, what are you doing? <laughs> And, and I realized that there were maybe 16 people in the world that I could really talk to. 
about two-tone suppression in the auditory nerve, and my mommy was not one of them. And I just decided that if I couldn't tell my mom how I was spending my time, I didn't want to be doing that thing. And so then, in fact, I began studying single neuron activity in response to sound. And once the animal learned an association between the sound, and now the sound had a meaning, sound to meaning, suddenly the neuron, I could see it in front of my eyes firsthand. I could see plasticity happening. And it, you know, it was very easy to explain to my mom what is going on. And she could think about the languages she learned and the music she makes and, and think about it in, in this context. Um, but I have wanted to be able to use the, 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 the very strict biology that we have in animal models in a way that can be applied directly to humans today. And so um, in, I've been looking for the granularity of sound processing. And that is really the big issue is that in animal models, you have this tremendous granularity. And we want to be able to have the same kind of granularity in terms of the information that we extract from a human being in terms of processing sound. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think we have, we have found that. Uh, we have a measure of sound processing in the brain that we call um, the frequency following response. And it gives us this granularity. It also is sensitive to individual differences because our new frontier, certainly as biologists, is we need to be able to have metrics that can tell us about how every single one of us is different. And in fact, everybody has a neural signature. And your neural signature is the same. Um, one year and 10 years later, there are going to be some minor changes that we can measure uh, that are meaningful, but the essential signature is very unique. Um, so we can measure sound processing in the brain, and um, we have uh, scalp electrodes that are picking up the electricity, sound is coming into the brain, and we have a response. And you can see right away that the response actually physically resembles the stimulus. I mean, that's crazy. You know, you never have a situation where usually what you are measuring as a biologist is a very abstract representation of, um, of sound. Um, and because it looks so similar, and this, you know, this is electricity, these are signals, or wonderful signals that I, I love, you know, I, I think, well, I, 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 have, I can take the electrical signal that my electric guitar picks up and deliver it through a speaker, and it will, you can sonify it. Well, you can do the same thing with a brainwave. And so um, here's a sound wave, Duh. and here's a brain wave. Duh. Sound wave. Duh. Duh. You'll hear a scale and the brain's response to the scale. <laughs> Little Mozart, and then the brain takes over. <laughs> And this is my favorite. Right? Okay, so the, the fact is, but these are biological responses in individual people. We have a lot to work with. Um, so if I record the responses to, say, a speech sound, there are so many ingredients sound-wise, in just in, in the consonant and the vowel, you all know this, and we can see how good a job your brain does at processing all of these individual components of sound. So timing, phase, um, the, the envelope, the harmonics of sound, the fundamental, these are all aspects of sound processing that are um, they're, they're unique. One of the reasons that I like to use a mixing board analogy is because if you have expertise, not all aspects of sound processing are 
elevated. Um, if you have a disorder, it's not that all aspects of sound processing are disordered. Rather, there are particular bottlenecks, and understanding what those bottlenecks are can really inform us and can really inform rehabilitation, can tell us, first of all, very objectively in a individual human, is there an auditory processing deficit, and what is the nature of that deficit? So just to explain a little bit, so here, um, you know, we can look at the strength of the fundamental frequency, which is a very important pitch cue. It really helps me identify um, Marty's voice or uh, the sound of, 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 of the water outside. Um, and then the harmonics that are important in uh, distinguishing different instruments and consonants. Uh, we can look at the timing of, um, very importantly, the, of the format transitions that are important for distinguishing sounds. And again, we can just see the more red that is here. If you have ba and ga, the a ah is the same, so there's no difference. But in this individual child, the difference between the b and the ga is processed very, very well. And you know, again, this is processing on the order of fractions of milliseconds. So in microsecond processing, you can see more, you know, easy to, to interpret, more red, better processing. Um, we can look at especially the consonant timing in noise um, and how stable. This is a very important thing for literacy, how stable the response is from trial to trial. Because if I play one sound, and then I play the same sound again, and your brain responds in a different wobbly way, how is a child to learn? So um, there are practical advantages of the FFR. It's objective. It's very well vetted. It's mobile. It's fast. It's repeatable. And it can really provide a uniform metric. That it's something you can, you can apply in animal models, in newborn babies to predict who's at risk for learning at, in three-year-olds and old, old people. Um, so sound is invisible, and it can be our ally and our enemy. And our life in sound shapes how the brain processes sound. So you can have language disorder, linguistic deprivation, noise, um, and you can have various aspects of training that make us better listeners. And so our experience in sound shapes how the brain automatically responds to sound. Some of the, the work that really influenced me here is work that Ravi Krishnan did at, at Purdue where he noticed that speakers of tonal languages, their brains responded to these sounds, the dipping sounds that happen, you know, the dipping tones that happen within a syllable. It's not something that happens in non-tonal languages. When these people were asleep, so they had made so many sound to meaning pairings in their lives that the automatic default state was this tremendously accurate pitch tracking. And this is what we can see. Our life in sound shapes how we process the world automatically and how we you know, walk into a classroom, walk into where, an airport, wherever we are, and um, we have this machinery that has been shaped. So let's talk about reading. And there are various theories of reading impairment. And sound and auditory, um, the, the processing of sound is very central to them. So you know, the idea that there are phonological differences in sounds, again, this, we get there because you make sound to meaning pairings. And over time, your brain automatically, just like the speakers of tonal languages, can categorize sounds. Um, we have auditory temporal processing. We have heard maybe about this. And, um, you know, and, and, and the work that, that Paula and Mike did was, was, you know, was absolutely, um, it, 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 was, you know, it still is breathtaking. Um, and you know, the idea that you need a system that can process, you know, that, that, because the auditory system is this temporal expert in the brain, if that goes awry, that is going to have severe consequences for language. Um, there is the magnocellular hypothesis, um, the, the temporal sampling hypothesis, because sound occurs in various time frames, um, noise exclusion, so that uh, the, 
the nervous system has a difficult time knowing automatically what to pay attention to and what to inhibit. Uh, but all of these have been, been studied, and you know, interestingly, no one has really noticed that all of these theories of reading are rooted in sound. So if you look at stability, so if you have a response and no jitter, um, you know, you end up with something like this. And, and, and again, uh, if, if you can listen to uh, the syllables are either ba, da, and ga, and if they're jittered, see if you can figure out what they are. So if, if you were listening, if, you know, the acoustics are not tremendous here for this, but... Um, you really need the lack of jitter in order to be able to figure out which order these syllables occurred. Um, and so we can measure sound processing in the brain and see how jittered the response is from trial to trial. You play a da, and you measure the brain's response to da. You play the da again, you measure it again. And you can see if the response is jittered compared to stable. And you can basically just come up with a very simple computation. It's, it's a correlation. It's a trial by trial correlation. And it's either highly correlated or not. Why it's interesting is that there is a beautiful relationship, a very systematic relationship between reading skill and how stably your brain responds to sound. Um, this has been shown in animal models. Um, out of, of, of the Kilgard lab, looking at uh, single neurons again in uh, genetic models of language, language genes. Um, and, and again, you see that the, this, this trial by trial instability is something that characterizes these uh, genetically um, uh, shaped animals. Um, in our animal models, uh, you know, you can play sounds, and we can see that the intertrial jitter, again, on a single neuron level, which is something that you can do in an animal, um, corresponds very, very beautifully to what you can measure on the scalp, either in the animal or in the human. So we really know something about the biological mechanism here. So back to reading. We have the stability measure that has a nice systematic relationship with reading. And we also know that uh, it turns out that rapid auditory naming as a test uh, is, is very much a, a mediating uh, factor between stability and reading. And, and you know, this ability to rapidly auditory name comes from this uh, ability to have been making sound to meaning connections in your life that are then easily accessible. Um, and we didn't see a relationship there with, with phonological processing, so it was really this rapid auditory naming. Um, what is interesting here is that um, we did a study where we were, these are kids who uh, were in a, a school for children with uh, reading impairments. And these are, are very smart kids who come into the school for one year at most two, and they, um, are um, you know, given various forms of, of remediation. Um, and what we, what we did is we randomly assigned um, assistive listening devices in the classroom. And so half of the kids were able to learn what to pay attention to. And over the course of a year, you know, we started out with kids who had very poor neural stability, and the ones who wore the device, you could actually see in their brain's response a year later. Without, the, they're not wearing the device anymore, but their brain is now responding to sound stably. And guess what? They improved in their reading. So our, our life and sound um, reflects the past and importantly, can predict the future. So it's, it's kind of a form of, 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 of time travel, right? Um, and we know from many studies, so Dorothy Bishop did a whole um, 
uh, meta-analysis, that if, if you look at kids uh, who are language impaired and the ones who get intervention before they are about around kindergarten, they are much more likely to become normal readers, whereas the ones who do not get intervention by that time are much, much, much more likely to struggle to learn to read. So early assessment is very important. And we uh, have a project that we call BioTOTS, where we um, measure longitudinally in kids. We start at the age of three, and we measure them for five years as they develop their language. Um, we look at their language skills, and we look at their um, brain responses to sound. And so one of the things that, that we saw right away was in three-year-olds, the kids who had better phonological skills, their brain just automatically was better able to categorize these sounds. Okay, so this is in three-year-olds, and they didn't have to do anything. You could just see it objectively. But what about predicting language ability? So if you take a speech sound and you present it in noise, because that's a typical learning when we live in a noisy world, um, and you now look, see, remember, just in response to the consonant, there are all these ingredients that you can look at. Stability, uh, timing, uh, the strength of the harmonics, and stability, harmonics, timing. And if you look at these all together, first of all, we can take um, this particular model and in kids who we already know what their reading skills is, are, we know that their response to sound to these three ingredients tracks with their reading skill, okay? So we know that this is a good measure. But we want to know what about the little guys? And so what we have been able to discover is that if you measure the same sound processing in the brain in three-year-olds, not only will it tell you about their language development at three, but it will predict, because remember, we have this longitudinal study, it will predict their reading skills, or not their, their language skills, um, one and two years later. So this is important. If you can measure sound processing in the brain at age three and be able already to determine who is going to be at risk to struggle reading, this is extremely important because it enables you to then intensify, to provide services to the kids who really need them. And you know, my vision is that, that this will be a part of, of newborn screening someday, that not only do we want to know is sound getting in, but we want to know is sound, is, is, is meaning, is, is, sound, is, is, is sound being processed in a way that the brain can make sense of it? And is there already a bottleneck? Because we know that there's always this, this combination between nature and nurture. Um, so, you know, we have a three-year-old. We want to predict his, his reading and language skills at five um, and then, you know, determine from this response what he's going to be like a number of years later. And, and we can do that. So, you know, we really we, we have a way of, of, of doing this. Um, linguistic deprivation obviously has an impact on processing sound. We know uh, how many of you have heard of the 30 million word gap. Um, it turns out that the kids whose moms have less education are likely to hear 30 million fewer words by the time they're three or four years old. And this is something that uh, is, is responsible, people have shown, um, for the, um, the, 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 the gap that we often see um, between kids who have had this kind of stimulation and not. And so we have done work, again, because I want to take our work out of the laboratory and into the world. Um, and, and again, you know, even when, when we, this is not something NIH will fund because, they, you know, they want to fund laboratory research. And even it's not work that, that, that certain journals will want to publish because 
it is um, outside of the scope of you know typical um, uh, uh, laboratory-based science, but I'm using very, very, very rigorous laboratory-based science in an environment that is much more ecologically valid. So um, we looked at Chicago area schools and the Harmony Project in Los Angeles, and these are, are both in very low-income areas. And interestingly, again, we could see in the brain waves, we, we took these high school kids and divided them. To their, so they're all uh, living in these low-income neighborhoods. They are being educated in the same classroom. We simply divided them based on their mom's education. And we found that the kids whose moms had less education had more neural noise, okay, so just noise in their wiring in the absence of stimulation. It's just always there. Uh, because the nervous system, if it's not being stimulated enough, it, 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 it manufactures information. In terms of sound processing, we saw that some of these aspects of sound processing were diminished. So you end up with a situation where, you know, imagine you're listening to the radio, and on the one hand, there's more static, and on top of it, the announcer's voice is kind of muffled. So how are you to learn? And so, you know, we were interested, again, in plasticity. What can be done? And this is, you know, where, uh, well, fast forward, has, 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 has had, I am certain, a huge impact on the stimulation, the development, and the processing of these kids. And, it, um, you know, I, 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 this is something that, that we could really scale with large-scale studies and, 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 and demonstrate. Um, but what we were able to do is, you know, we, we showed that there's this signature of linguistic deprivation, high neural noise, poor harmonics, poor stability, and we saw that making music, so music is kind of the jackpot in terms of cognitive, sensory, motor, and reward systems. And the kids who had music as part of their curriculum, um, it didn't fix the effects of linguistic deprivation, but it sure offset them. So this is, uh, this is uh, you know, these are data. We see this very objectively, biologically, and the message is that, you know, we are what we do, and making sound-to-meaning pairings in a way that involves our sensory, cognitive, and reward system is something that is very, very effective, and that is behind the entire fast-forward concept. So the other thing is that it takes time. With music education, after one year of music education, we did not see changes in the, the kids' brains. But after two years, both in the elementary school kids in Los Angeles and in the high school kids in Chicago, uh, we saw these very uh, uh, objective changes in the way the brain automatically res responds to elements of sound processing that we know are important for making sense of sound and making sense of speech sounds. So it boosts literacy too. I mean, this is the important thing, is that there is this relationship between, we, we have shown it between music and language that is a very, very powerful one. So you can do a number of things, whether it's fast forward or it's, it's, it's music, even learning another language. Ways of engaging sound and meaning can strengthen the brain for language. Um, and, and importantly, at last, you know, we find that the people who have had musical training in their background are, have auditory brains, even decades after they've stopped playing the music, that are um, better at processing sounds. And this is because if once you have learned to make these sound to meaning connections, they become ingrained and they get reinforced by daily life and daily use. And so they're there and they become part of the default system of the brain. <clears throat> so let's look at, at just some relationships between language and music. 
Um, so, you know, we see that, that some of these elements of sound processing that are important for music um, and strengthened by music are elements that are absolutely essential to language. So the same elements that we see diminished in a kid with a language and a reading impairment are ones that we see strengthened um, in, with music. And so if we look at phonology, working memory, and rhythm, you know, these are some of the theoretical under, underlying reasons. Um, you know, we know that for language, tracks with reading ability, uh, this phonology, and we know that people who make music, and it's not listening to music, it's actually making music that matters. I like to say, you're not going to get physically fit by watching sports. Um, so people who make music, and here I'm not talking about professional musicians, I'm talking about hack musicians like me, who um, just regularly play some music. Um, again, we see that poor readers um, have very poor distinctions of these speech sounds, um, and we know that musicians are, have, have better, I mean, you know, so this is not musical sounds. You see this generalization, this transfer of the ability to pull out details from sound in music, because music actually requires a lot more precision than, uh, than processing some language. Because, you know, like we're able to, to, to follow music when people have foreign accents and we have a crummy connection on our cell phone. But with music, you know, a tiny timing um, uh, or, or, or pitch change can, you know, really affect the musicality. Um, auditory working memory is something that's very important for language, we know. Um, it, it's something that's strengthened with music. Uh, this representation of the harmonics, we know it tracks with reading ability and it is enhanced by making music. Um, rhythm is an important aspect of music and it is also extremely important. It gives us a temporal map in language for where important information lies. And so, you know, there's been a relationship between rhythm and reading and also between the ability to tap to a beat and reading. Kids who are not very good at doing this often have reading problems. And interestingly, when we look at this neural stability, we see that there is this relationship between the ability to tap to a beat and how stable the brain's response to sound is. So here you have this biological mechanism that is being shaped by, again, it's a pairing of sound and meaning, sound and movement. So remember, I told you before that you have this stability that tracks with reading skills. So, you know, if, if you look at uh, a kid's ability to, tra to tap along to a beat, this kid's But yeah, he's only three. Um, but, but you know, here, here are the rhythms in the speech sound, and you can see that the synchronizers are, they, they just have better following of these responses than the non-synchronizers, and importantly, the synchronizers have better language skills, okay? Um, I wonder if, um, has anyone used an interactive metronome? And it, it, it's kind of interesting, you know, we have been, we've actually done a study um, about, you know, just what is it that interactive metronome measures? And we, we know that there are different kinds of um, rhythm skills. And so there's a rhythm skill of kind of tapping along to the to, to the beat, you know, da 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 da, or da 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 da. And these things um, really, in the, in the given individual, um, you know, I thought, again, I'm so often wrong. Um, I thought that that if you're good at one kind of rhythm, you'd be good at the other kind of rhythm, but it's not true. These are dissociated. Um, so people have certain rhythm, skills, and deficits. But interestingly, interactive metronome, um, it was the only measure where there was a, a, a union where kids who, uh, there actually was a relationship between how they performed on these different kinds of rhythm tasks. So um, 
anyway, I just think this is something that needs to be studied further. Um, and, and it surprised me. Okay, so now if we look at, at listening disorders in children, um, I think what is very important is to be able to determine biologically and objectively, you know, it's a switch. Is there evidence, is there biological evidence of a sound processing difficulty? So just knowing that I think is important. And this can guide you know, our rehabilitation strategies. If we look at remediating sound processing in the brain, um, <clears throat> so the aerobics is a, a computer-based program that uh, we studied a number of years ago. And um, again, what we were able to find is that um, because the, um, well, this is the response in noise and the response in quiet, and you can correlate them one to the other, and basically we found that the kids who went through the training program were less affected by the noise, so their correlations were higher after training than they were before training, okay? So we really could see biological evidence of an effect. Um, the brain fitness program, so this is posit science, um, where, again, you have this, you know, it's very much like fast forward. Uh, you have this adaptive shortening of consonant vowel transitions. You have these adaptive increases in memory demands, which you're all familiar with. Um, and again, this is effective because it pulls in the cognitive sensory motor and reward systems in the brain. Um, so, you know, we, we looked at these, um, uh, the impact of training biologically in older adults, uh, 75 of them, and they came to Northwestern. We had kids who went through the brain, excuse me, kids, um, um, older adults who went through the brain fitness program and then we had an active control where they watched, uh, they were randomly assigned, um, the, the participants, where they watched educational videos for the same amount of time as the training, and they had to actively answer questions um, throughout um, the, their video watching. But they weren't having this sound to meaning training that is sort of at the core of the Posit Science Brain Fitness Program. And they came back eight weeks later to Northwestern, um, so we looked at various aspects of biological processing, speech and noise, and cognitive effects. Um, and what I want to show you here is the neural responses. So this is timing to the consonant and to the vowel part of a speech syllable. What we can see is that the active control did not change in terms of their timing. But what we saw was that the people who went through the training, and this is now just eight weeks later, that their response to the timing in consonants got faster. And also to the vowel, but especially to the tricky part, the fast part, the tricky part of sound. Um, we found that their hearing and noise got better. Working memory improved, as did speed of processing. So all things that are important for communication in older adults. So, you know, I, where I see is that, that um, future interventions can be tailored um, by the information that we get from the biology. What I, I really see is, is, is that, you know, if you measure responses to sound, uh, you may decide based on the particular responses that you get that a particular training program is uh, one that you would choose over another. Um, let's look at, at Fast Forward, and, and, and Marty mentioned this work that we did with uh, autism. So one of the things that we know about autism is that the children do not have difficulty understanding what I say, but how I mean it. So was it a question? Was it a statement? If you take a, 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 a sound and you make it go down in pitch, like I'm ending a sentence, or up in pitch, like I'm asking a question. Um, a typically developing kid, again, this is microsecond precision, will track this very, very, very well. And we know that kids on the autism spectrum, not all of them, and this is where it's important, this is where the individuality is so key, because not every child on the autism spectrum has this as a bottleneck. It is only certain children. And so, you know, being able to know, 
is this or is this not a bottleneck in a particular child, to me, <clears throat> is giving, you know, I mean, it's, knowledge is empowering. Um, so in, what, what we, we did is um, these are kids who, before the fast forward, this was an, an individual child, so this was a small study. And again, the fast forward had benefits in some of the kids, but not all the kids. But this is a child who started out with a deficit in the first place in tracking pitch. And afterwards, after the fast forward, uh, we saw that the pitch tracking improved. So this is interesting. Um, and, and, you know, finally, the assistive listening devices that I mentioned before, uh, you know, we had these kids who wore the assistive listening devices for a year and a set of kids in the same classroom who did not. And I, I showed you this before, you know, where the kids who, and, and, and you know, one of the things that, that um, also seems like an important aspect of making sense of sound is um, even, you know, kids, these are kids who have normal hearing thresholds. Just wearing a very low gain hearing aid is something that can, you know, increasingly, um, I, my colleagues are saying that this is a useful way of getting people to pay attention to sound. Let, let me give you an example. So uh, my husband is, is a musician. And uh, the other day I was trying to listen, I was trying to play uh, a, a Dire Straits lead. And I was listening. And um, as I was trying to sort of resolve the physical complexities of, um, you know, what I was hearing and playing those notes, he came by and he said, Nina, if you just listen, you would hear that when he, you're, you're hearing this sequence of very fast notes, he is not picking those notes. He's not using a pick. He is pulling off the strings with his left hand. And that's a very distinctive sound. I mean, the notes are the same but they sound differently if they're being pulled off or picked. I was deaf to that. Once I understood and I was able to make that sound to meaning connection, I get it. So it's really important to know what to learn, what to pay attention to. And again, I think this is part of how Fast Forward works because you get this, this, this appreciation and development of learning that different aspects of sound have meaning. So, you know, how do we strengthen auditory processing? You know, and, and certainly if, if in a toddler you have a listening problem, um, there are a number of, of, of um, courses of action. Um, so music training, if you want it, we have a review in this neuroscientist paper that looks at those evidence. I, I talked about the focusing of the auditory attention. Um, but, you know, you know that one-on-one that -on -one speech therapy is very, very effective. Um, it is not the most practical solution for everyone. Um, but that's why we have computer-based training programs that are enormously effective and enormously rewarding. And again, it doesn't have to be for every child, but there are certainly many, many, I mean, the, 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 the idea is so rooted in basic biology and basic neuroscience. Um, and, and, you know, the idea of learning more languages. This is important. Um, so, you know, you can guide rehabilitation strategies by strengths and weaknesses, whether it's timing, stability. Uh, you know, you can, like if I was doing one-on-one -on -one therapy, I would really think about phonetic contrasts. If there was a timing bottleneck, um, stability is really a matter of, of training attention to meaningful sounds. Um, this harmonics is, the, the, and the, 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 in particular, the, the representation of the fundamental frequency is very important for listening and noise. And so if you have a deficit there, which most kids with reading problems do not. Most kids have good representation of the fundamental frequency. It's poor harmonics. But if you see that the fundamental frequency is not strong enough, then you know that this is someone for whom uh, especially training in, in challenging listening environments is going to be very important. So, you know, we have this, this cognitive sensory motor and reward network, and, you know, the frequency falling response really gives us a snapshot of auditory processing. Um, 
Auditory processing is a well-known bottleneck for language disorders. The SFR gives us an objective snapshot of auditory processing. It tracks with and predicts listening and language skills. You can discover vulnerability before the language problems emerge. Um, and so, you know, I really see that this is a future of making uh, the biological assessment of sound processing, um, the, the, the biology, getting that information really should, this is knowledge that we are so looking for in understanding individual children. Um, so I think we can use this to, to, to select and monitor uh, real rehabilitation. And importantly, you know, we have this ability to be able to harness the biology um, to inform language disorders in kids. Um, you know, so we, we need uniform outcome measures. We need evidence-based, personalized biological outcomes. Um, we're working to overcome some of the barriers right now. Measuring these responses is it expensive and not especially user-friendly. We're working on um, creating a platform that is um, user-friendly and, um, and, and more cost-effective. Um, and, you know, I've just edited a book on the frequency following response. It has really uh, come, it, it, it was interesting to, to see it at a number of conferences just in this past year that scientists um, and, you know, people working in clinically applicable fields are seeing the tremendous use of this metric. Um, and so, you know, I think that we can take this information then this biological processing of sound to empower um, you know, all of us to make the best decisions in terms of, of, of assessment and monitoring of individual kids. So I'm going to end by you know, saying that auditory processing is really this combination of hearing, speech, language, learning. Um, you know, I, I'm so distressed by the compartmentalization, compartmentalization of fields. Um, because, well, nature doesn't respect disciplines. Nature does not respect disciplines. Um, these are the folks in, in my lab who do the, the heavy lift, lifting. Um, and I want you to know, so I write this, 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 um, these articles every month or two, uh, in, it's in the hearing journal. And you know, again, you know, please, I know most of you are, um, are, are, are speech language pathologists, or many of you. Um, you know, don't be put off by the fact that this is you know, in a hearing journal, and it really bothers me, uh, because it, basically what, we, what we, we do is try to write about clinically meet how, how science is informing clinically relevant issues. So if you would please, so what we've done is we put this all in one place for you to find. If you go to our magical website, which is BrainVolts, um, and if you look, just look for BrainVolts in my name, you'll, it'll come up right away. Um, but if you look under publications, there is four clinicians and four clinicians will bring up all of these. They're, they're just a page long, but they are really meant to be digestible ways of taking the science and expressing how the science is clinically relevant. So this is, our, this is the home page of our magical website. So it's um, brainvolts.northwestern.edu. And if you go to this home page, um, if you click on any one of these, you will find, you know, um, go to that, that home page. I suggest that you start with the friendly overview slideshows, which um, are basically a picture and a line of text that summarize two years of work. Um, <laughs> but, but it'll give you the overview of what it is that we're doing in reading, for example. Um, and then you, and you can go as deep and deep and deep as you want. You can download all the articles. 
Um, and, and and look at look at some of of, of, the, of the media, especially the, the podcasts, the one in sound, because um, those guys are pros. They're really good at connecting how what it is that scientists do um, is is important for uh, human health. Um, and also down here, which you can't see, um, is a little video of our biological approach. So it's a two-minute long video, and it will give you a sense of, of how it is that we measure these responses. Um, so I encourage you, please, to, to go to this website. It's, it's, a, it's a labor of love. Um, it really takes a lot. Of, we have updated almost every day um, because we want so much to communicate our little discoveries and to put them in a way that uh, hopefully will, will, will do you some good and do especially good to the people who um, you serve. So, yeah. So, um, this is what I got. Thank you. Well, it sounds like um, hello, hello, hello. Is this working? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, sounds like everybody else enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, so we have some questions from the back. I have a question. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about what harmonics are in speech. Oh, yes. Yeah. Is that, a good, is that something everybody else yeah. kind of wants to know? Yeah. So, so the harmonics are the Aspects of sound, um, so I mean, you, you guys really know this. You know about the source and filter. You know that, that you have the vocal folds that, that vibrate at a certain rate. And so if we're now just talking about speech, okay? And this determines the fundamental frequency, right? The frequency of the vibration of the item. It could be a string. It could be um, any vibrating. Now we're talking about the vocal folds. And then it is shaped by the filter, and the filter, so the, the particular speech sounds that you make, and the shape of the, the, the whole resonant cavity um, is what shapes, what gives you the harmonics. And so the harmonics are very, very, very important for distinguishing one sound from the other. So the fundamental frequency will tell me who's talking, and it will also tell me something about about, about uh, the emotional part, the pitch. Um, but if I said ba, ga, or da, that information is carried by the harmonics. Okay. Great, right, thank you. Okay, are there questions in the room? Aditi, Peter, okay. Um, I'll go to you guys after the virtual person. The question from someone online is, did, did Dr. Krauss use sound field listening systems to see the impact on entire class, on an entire class? Or is the research on personal systems? Right. So each child, so because you know it was important for us to have um, the controls of the kids who were not wearing the device being taught in the same classroom. So um, the the, uh, the kids wore something that is it's a, a product that was made uh, by Phonak. Uh, it, it, yeah. Well, it was called the EduLink then, and now it's called something else. And basically, it, um, it, it, it's personalized. So it, it, they wear this little, cute little earring. Um, and the teacher wears a transponder, which then delivers the, the, the teacher's voice directly to the kid's ear. So the, the child is then better able to learn what to pay attention to, because what is happening it, meaningfully in the classroom is the teacher talking and not the sound of, of the chair scraping. So in, in this study, um, this is how we did it. But there's no reason, I mean, in, from theoretically, there's no reason why this wouldn't work in a whole classroom with a, a, a classroom FM system. Good I have question. a question about the, um, the education level of the mother. I mean, that, that's really fascinating. And is, is, is that on a continuum? In other words, if it's, if the, if the education level is really, really, really low, were those kids really, really, really low too? Mm -hmm. 
or was yeah. it kind of general once it got to a certain no, point? No, it, it, it is on a continuum. There's a lot of data on this. Um, so often maternal education is used as a, as a proxy for, for, for poverty, for um, socioeconomic status. Um, and uh, there, there's been a lot of research indicating that um, you know, there, there really is this relationship between um, education, the level of education. Um, but, you know, I, I guess there is a certain point at which, um, you know, it's almost like an action potential and it fires, you have enough education. Um, but it's really, especially in the lower ends of the maternal education where there is this continuum of um, the, the, this 30 million word gap, which is being um, studied very, now more and more carefully. There's a, a, a system called the Lena system where kids wear devices that record all of their uh, productions all day long and also who has been talking with them. And, you know, it's not just the total number of words because words coming from, you know, a, a, a television, for example, um, don't count. It really is, the, you know, the, the words and the interaction. And it, it turns out that, that um, educational level tracks with, uh, you know, how much interaction and talking there is that, that, that gets done and how uh, abstract concepts are, um, how syntactically complex the sentences are, um, and so, all, you know, all of these, these factors are, are, are ingredients here. Um, and, and again, it really relates to, um, with, with education, there seems to, to be, there was a very nice article in the New Yorker not too long ago called The Talking Cure um, that you might want to take a look at. But it, it's interesting how uh, some of the moms who had less education um, were not as reinforcing to their kids as they were, you know, when, when they were learning, you know, they'd say, oh, there's a, there's, there's a gog. Um, and the, um, the, the, the less educated mom was more likely to criticize, the, 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 you know, not criticize, correct, you know, no, that's not a, a, a gog, that's a dog, you know, whereas with more education comes the, um, yes, sweetie, that's a doggy, and look at him, he's wagging his tail, and, so, you, know, and you, you kind of uh, embellish on all of that linguistic information, as well as the, um, the, this emotional reward part. Thank you. It's so exciting to be here with you. What about a nanny? What about a nanny? What about a nanny being with a child the first three to five years of its life? Um, and it's education. Does that mean the nanny needs to be well educated as well? Or what about nannies who speak Spanish or speak Mandarin and are with English monolingual speaking parents? It's, re it's a matter of how much interaction there is between the child and the, and, and, and the caregiver. And, you know, and it turns out, I mean, I'm just writing an op-ed piece for um, uh, bilingualism. Uh, speaking another language knows no economic boundaries. I mean, you know, people know that, I mean, that if you stimulate a child with, with more languages and that, that this is actually a very good thing, um, and we have done some studies on bilingual kids, Spanish-English bilingual kids, and this effect of maternal deprivation is actually strengthened by kids in kids who speak another language. So speaking another language is, as our former Secretary of Education said, um, he said that um, speaking another language in, in, in the home is an asset that should be valued because it, it creates a more flexible mind, not only in childhood, but as we get older, um, speaking another language can um, make you less likely to get cognitive decline. Yeah, so um, is this working? Yeah, there we go. Um, I wanted um, you to maybe comment uh, a bit about the engagement of the motor system um, in these tasks because, um, and, uh, and the consequences of that because for example, learning uh, music or practicing music, even if you're a hack musician, one of the things that's going to happen is that the timing of your motor responses, uh, in addition, to, uh, need to be improved over time in order to make uh, better 
uh, musical sequences, which means your motor sequencing ability is improving at the, at the same time. Um, and I, I also, I'd like to comment on uh, something that one of our uh, pri one of the scientific learning private practice uh, uh, folks uh, discovered on their own with about fifty a, a fairly large group of kids in her private practice, where she um, was also working with them on writing skills. And so she had um, she had writing samples from this group of kids that went through fast forward, pre and post fast forward. Um, pretty amazing uh, changes in the motor sequencing ability as it applies to writing. Never published, um, but I, I will also say that uh, in fast forward, there are critical motor timing requirements of the task that if you aren't able to respond rapidly, quickly, et cetera, in response to a change in the auditory sequence with an appropriately timed motor sequence response, um, you, you aren't going to be successful at that task. And so you, kids improve at that motor sequencing, motor timing task at the same time that they're improving in the auditory discrimination um, uh, uh, tasks in, in the time domain. So I think it's a, a really fascinating area, the, the motor side of this, um, that it's sort of bi-directional. Um, anyways, yeah. I'd, I'd be interested in your comments. Yeah, no, very, I mean, what you said, I, I you know, it could be coming out of my mouth. Um, I, 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 it makes a lot of sense, and, and so it, it's, it's actually fundamental to the, uh, the, the, the framework, the theoretical framework that I'm operating from. You know, I, I said cognitive sensory motor and reward. And so, you know, as we speak, we are coordinating our, our mouths with what we're hearing. Um, you know, the, this idea of playing an instrument and having the motor feedback, which is why that just listening is not going to do it. Um, when you, you interact with a computer and you have it, it's synchrony, um, which is also why there is this link with rhythm. And, you know, we can now study this, and we have studied it. So, I mean, this is why the, the interactive metronome folks came to, to, to us. And, and they said, you know, um, you know you, you've shown this relationship between rhythm and the ability to synchronize to sounds, motorically, and language skills. <laughs> Um, you know what, 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 what's, what's, what's going on here, and we, you know we can really see that um, the ability to synchronize and to synchronize in the sound wave, so how the brain synchronizes to the sound wave it's hearing, and how people synchronize motorically tracks with language skill. So that's and and, and again, I think it speaks to the integration of these different aspects of, 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 of communication that are sadly so compartmentalized both in the scientific world and in the clinical world. And we have to be thinking. I mean, the motor system is, is completely an integral part of the system. Um, I don't know if this is really off topic, but I was thinking about some of the kids who have significant non-fluency due to maybe stuttering or to Tourette's or, or um, and would you be able to see something um, in their timing and in their temporal sequencing that we could use for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes? Yeah. So I don't think that's off base at, at all. Uh, my dear. So, you know, I, you know, we are really at... Um, you know, we now have this amazing way of assessing sound processing in the brain that we and others have already indicated, published that there are these, these, these links and connections. There is so much work to be done, and a very important population is stuttering, and the stuttering also has to do with the auditory motor feedback component. And so... Um, there has, has not been, to my knowledge, a study looking at the FFR in stutterers. This is a study that is, I, I hope that, that you will do it. 
um, th th these, these are studies, th these are, and, and, and you know, to have the objective biological piece of it together with the clinical piece is, um, is, is, is just eye, ear, mouth opening. We have lots of questions, but I'm not going to make you answer all of them. So we'll take a couple in the room and then a couple more virtually. Thank you so much for all of this. It's been fascinating. I had a question about um, the use of FN systems and the time that it's being implemented. Is this ongoing? And if it is, does it then inhibit their ability to function in life when it's noisy? No, no, no. So, so what is, is really cool, or yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for for your question. The the point, and even in, in our study, was that after the kids had worn this device for a year, and it might have been that if they wore it for a few months, that would have been enough. I don't know. It was just for our study, it was a year. After they'd worn it for a year, they were assessed in the lab without the device, both before and after. And after they had learned to associate to make good sound to meaning connections they didn't need the device anymore and you know and this is also I think at why it is that if, if you learn I mean how many of you have, have, have played a musical instrument at some time in your life almost everyone how many of you are still playing not as many but that's why you have such big brains but the fact that, that you have this investment and you know this is you know, when I talk to the Department of Education and the idea of um, you know, that, 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 that music should be part of our education because it enables us to develop all kinds of skills that not only help you go through school, but help you help us as we, throughout our lives. It has a lasting, lasting impact because of your question, because of once you have made this connection, and it's like with the, with the tone language speakers. Once you've made the connection between the sound and the meaning, then you have a brain that automatically, the default system of the brain is one that processes sounds effectively. And it was interesting, you know, just with the, with the music in these um, two projects. So the, 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 the founders of the uh, projects came to me and, and they said, you know, we already know that the kids who play music are the ones who have better language skills and they do better in school. Um, but what's going on in their brains? And, you know, I, I think it's so exciting to be able to take this, this knowledge of Sound, sound waves and brain waves, and you know, electricity is the currency of the nervous system, and now we have access to this in a way that has never been possible before. We have this granularity in sound processing that you know before. Like, and if you look at even most evoked responses, you just look at well, you know, how fast and how big is it? You really want to know how all the different ingredients, the many complex ingredients that make up a, a speech stream or a musical stream, um, you know, how are all of these processed and where, how good a job is the brain doing at processing all of these individual components? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh. <laughs> Here I come. Um, I very I enjoyed your presentation very much. Um, so my brother he stutters, but when he sings or when he yeah. plays a sound or when he starts singing to one of his favorite songs, I do not hear any stuttering yeah. at all. So can you kind of explain why? How did that happen? Yeah. Well, again, it's it's this connection. It it, it very much has to do with rhythm. So, um, you know, as, as you're singing, you have a certain rhythmic quality and you have this auditory motor feedback that is helping, is guiding you and is um, giving you information that you otherwise don't have. I mean, this is, is a therapy that is also used in, um, in, in people who have had uh, um, various strokes, you know, melodic intonation therapy. Um, that you're able, you know, because also, you know, we have a nervous system that has specializations 
for language and for music. And you can use some of the specializations for music to help um, solidify the language. Okay, we have one. We're going to take one more question from the virtual people. Sorry, Donna. Um, there were a couple questions that came in kind of related to this. This is from Beth O'Brien, and she says, as an audiologist, I don't see the improvements with classroom listening systems that I see with personal systems. I've always thought that classroom acoustics, et cetera, really negatively impact and reduce benefits. Do I hear you saying that you believe they can be equally valuable, the personal versus the classroom? Uh, I didn't say, well, maybe I did say equally, but I didn't, I, what, what I, I was um, saying is that um, what is important is to strengthen the sound to meaning relationships. As far as I know, there is no study that is systematically comparing and contrasting a personalized system with a classroom system. I would expect that a personalized system would work better because it moves with the person and uh, the acoustics are just going to be better than the acoustics that you get in a classroom. Mm -hmm. This hasn't been studied systematically. And also, you know, as with fast forward, there are certain considerations that you have to think of in terms of practic practicability. So theoretically, yeah. doing it in a room should work. I don't know how it compares. Like, you know, without data, I would say that it should work. Probably not as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, 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 sometimes in a classroom it can be more scalable right. and practical than to have the individual fittings. And, um, and again, without data, I would expect that if you are able to enhance the sound to meaning connections um, with a, within a classroom, that that would be beneficial. But the science, again, the science, we, we need to be, inf I want to see a nice study comparing and contrasting individual listening systems with classroom systems. And, and to look at the biology, to look at learning measures, um, and then we would know. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important question. All right, we're going to wrap up. I do want to give an additional plug to the BrainVolt site. When I found this site, I felt like I had found the keys to the kingdom. It's the translation of very complex science into very understandable application. So we actually just wrote a blog posting on Tuesday about the low income auditory processing relationship. So mm. I'm going to continue to kind of follow, you know, these publications and try to even simplify them further and kind of connect fast forward. So but, but actually if if I can just say something about yeah. please, please, please look at the four clinicians. Um, just go to publications, look at the top, click on four clinicians and look at these little things that we write. Because it's 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 for you. And I would love, you know, always, you know, Bring it on, the feedback, positive, negative. Tell us how we can do things better. But this particular part is something that um, I, I would like to draw your attention to, and I hope it helps. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Are you going to go Check, 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 check. I'm on. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. Dr. Nina Kraut. Okay, great. How about a break, Carolyn? Feels good? Okay, we'll take a break. We'll take a 15-minute break. We're going to come back at 945. Before you leave, I have two announcements. One is a reminder. Please take all your personal items. If you forget them, you can find them on eBay. We'll be selling them. You can buy them back. But take them with you. We're gonna um, we're gonna reorganize rows three and five. Three and five, where Joan is. You'll sit in those chairs, and we have a nice little interactive activity. You've been learning from a lot of uh, presenters here so far. We'd like you to have the opportunity to learn from each other as well. So when you come back, ask you to fill in those chairs. Sounds